My name is uh, Ryan Hubbard. I'm a physical therapist at Wentworth Douglas Hospital. And uh, tonight we're going to talk some golf injuries, rehab, and performance. Uh, just a disclosure slide here. Uh, I have no financial disclosure or conflicts of interest with the presented material in this presentation. I'd like to start off uh, some golf talks with uh, some inspirational quotes. And I particularly like this one from Arnold Palmer. Uh, golf is deceptively simple and endlessly complicated. It satisfies the soul and frustrates the intellect. And at the same time is rewarding and maddening. It is without a doubt the greatest game mankind has ever invented. And if you ever played golf, I think you would agree with that. Uh, just some objectives uh, for this talk here. Uh, we're just going to talk about uh, some components of the golf swing um, and how we look at that from a physical therapy perspective, um, identify different swing changes and swing faults and, and limitations that we see uh, in the clinic with the amateur golfers that we work with, uh, understand common golf injuries and the causative factors of those injuries, and also um, look at the components of a proper golf warm-up uh, that we promote in the clinic for injury prevention and also just review opportunities within physical therapy. So just a little background on myself. Um, uh, I'm a local local kid. I uh, grew up in Durham, so I, I grew up uh, playing these uh, local courses around. I actually uh, learned at the par three course that's no longer there in Newmarket, Hickory Pond. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Um, so I really enjoy working with golfers in the area because a lot of them uh, play these courses um, so I can actually uh, talk with them about the courses they play and the, and the challenges they face. So it's fun. Um, so just to talk about golf injuries in, in general, there's always been kind of a, a stigma out there um, and there still is that, that golf is a sport without much demand, uh, has a slow pace of play and as the stigma at the age that you play is generally older, but we're actually seeing uh, younger and younger uh, uh, folks play golf, especially through the uh, first tee program through the PGA. Um, and it's, it's certainly a sport, um, you, you know, we see a lot of injuries with, you know, over a two year period, I'll reference a lot of different articles and studies in this, in this presentation, but uh, one in particular noted that 60% of professionals and about 40% of amateurs um, experience some type of injury while playing. In this table, I'll just give you a high level overview uh, from one of the studies, uh, just comparing amateur golfers and uh, professional golfers. Um, you know, you can certainly see that that each group uh, gets injured, um, but it just uh, broken down into different ways of how they get injured. Right. So a lot of the amateur golfers, yes, they get injured playing too much or practicing too much. But, you know, they also can have poor swing mechanics. Uh, they can hit the ground or something else when they're not meaning to. And these can cause injuries as well. But if you look at the professional golfers, golfers, the really uh, skilled folks, you know, it really comes down to just over practice in general for them. Um, and we'll kind of go over different injuries, um, you know, with with professional golfers and mostly overuse in nature. Um, we can also break down injuries based on kind of what we see uh, based on body region. So, you know, this compares a, a few different um, older studies from the 90s and, and early 2000s, but uh, just comparing uh, amateurs and professional golfers and just areas of their bodies commonly, they, they do get injured at uh, for both groups, um, you know, as we would anticipate low back uh, is high up there. Uh, with injury rate in that region. Uh, with amateurs, uh, the elbow is up there as well and uh, hand and wrist as well. And with the professionals, uh, hand and wrist injuries as well. Um, so injuries in the amateur golfer, kind of what we see uh, locally uh, here in the clinic in Dover at Wentworth Douglas, uh, we see injuries, you know, based on too much play or, or practice. Um, we see uh, subjectively from amateurs, you know, blaming poor swim mechanics or hitting the ground, you know, when they're not, um, when they're not supposed to, um, which can cause uh, uh, traumatic injuries. Um, and just a few studies here uh, from over in England, 32% uh, of amateurs reported sustaining just injuries in general. So about a third, um, most of them blaming more uh, poor swim mechanics and overuse. Um, and then another study looked at um, and it's almost 50-50 overuse injuries versus a single traumatic event. Uh, 
Amateur injuries continued here. Uh, another study looking at amateur golfers and, and common sites of injuries reported. Uh, again, common themes here, the back, shoulder, elbow, even the knee, um, and even a survey of amateur golfers that the back was the, the most common. So we'll touch on that uh, later in the presentation of, of why that may be. Uh, this gentleman here, Tiger Woods, uh, the slide amazes me depending on, on who uh, you think is the, the best golfer of all time, you know, may depend on which era you grew up with, but uh, there's no doubt uh, to play at a very high level uh, comes at a cost. Yes, you may have had injuries off the course as well, but uh, you can see here most of these injuries um, you know, while playing golf in general um, and kind of looking at the low back there and the amount of uh, surgeries Tiger Woods has had actually ending up with a spinal fusion. Um, it's actually amazing seeing him uh, play golf again. And uh, Tiger will come up a few times in this presentation. He's a physical therapist dream injury wise. He's got a great team around him, I'm sure. Uh, looking at the, the professional golfer, you know, we're seeing those overuse injuries because they're really practicing a lot and they, and they have to, to get that repetition. So, you know, they're, they're swinging the club at least 2000 times um, a week. So you can imagine um, a lot of injuries for that region alone. Um, and, you know, this study looked at wrist injuries were the most common in professional golfers. Um, a lot of repetitive motions there that can cause injuries. Um, and I'll kind of bring your attention down to the bottom. Um, you know, rate, the rate of injury actually increases as your handicap decreases. So, you know, meaning the, the better you are at golf, the more likely you are to get injured because you are likely practicing more and getting those overuse injuries. Um, and I highlighted Fred Couples here because uh, he's well known uh, actually to have, a, you know, a lot of back problems throughout his career. Uh, just to break down the golf swing, um, here we have Adam Scott, in my opinion, one of the, the best swings on tour still. Um, you, know, you know, the golf swing in general, the way we look at it's very dynamic motion, uh, very rotational, uh, requires a lot of, um, you know, mobility, stability, balance, and uh, Adam Scott surely uh, shows that with his golf swing. Um, understanding the golf swing uh, kind of components. So these are things uh, that your uh, golf professional are looking at. Um, those folks, you know, at the courses that are, are giving lessons, they're kind of, you know, breaking down what you need based on kind of how you look in these phases of the swing. So we have address, backswing, downswing, impact, and then follow through. So looking at address, uh, this is something, you know, we can look at in the clinic and as actually um, an important component of the physical screen that we do, um, you know, and you're in an athletic starting position, you know, what you can do with your swing, um, you know, is based upon kind of how you start and how your body is positioned. Uh, body weights generally center between the feet. Uh, spine is neutral. That's important and something I'll explain a little later down the road. Um, and, the, and the club is grip lightly. We see a lot of injuries, uh, you know, when the, when the club is held too tightly. Uh, this just shows a picture of uh, just proper alignment just from one study. Um, you know, the biggest thing we're looking at here is, you know, the trunk is tilted forward, uh, but the spine we're seeing here is, is kind of in a straight line. You're not seeing the head forward. Uh, you're not seeing too much arc, arch in the back or too much round in the mid back that can uh, prevent motion. Uh, just optimal positioning to, um, to, to have a good solid golf swing. Uh, and then comes the backswing. So this is kind of when the, the club is elevated to the highest uh, position, your shoulders and hips rotate as well along, along the axis. Um, your body weight shifts towards your right foot if you're a righty golfer, uh, your trail leg there, uh, your wrist flex upward, um, and, and you have a lot of hip, knee, um, and ankle action in that motion as well. And your back, your back hip rotates in. And then you initiate your downswing. So this is when your hips start rotating towards the target. And it's actually this, this transition here, which is where we see an increase uh, demand on the low back and, and reasons for cumulative back injuries, really, that we'll touch on later in the presentation. Um, 
This is when weight shifts uh, towards your towards your front leg. Uh, your lower body initiates the, the club's downward descent. So they've done studies where they kind of break down the timing of your body parts while you swing. And it's actually a lot of folks think it's, you, you know, your hands uh, or your arms that start that motion, but it's actually your hips uh, that initiate that downswing. And that's actually important um, and something that's, um, you know, seen in pretty much every uh, professional golfer out there. And then impact, um, you know, it, we, we watch a lot of golf on TV. We see uh, professional golfers out there. You know, a lot of them have different looking swings overall, but it's really the impact uh, that is alike for, for all of them. It's kind of how they, how they strike the ball, um, how they make that contact consistently. Uh, that's very similar across the spectrum in professional golf. And when we strike, strike the ball uh, correctly, that's a good feeling when we play as well. And then you have follow through. So we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of balance required um, to kind of hold this position. Your body, you know, rotates to face the target. Um, your left forearm supinates, which means rotates um, as well as your, your other forearm. Um, and then your, your weight shift, uh, you know, goes primarily to your lead foot there. Um, you know, which requires a lot of balance. So upper extremity, we'll just kind of go through, uh, you know, some injuries I see uh, in the clinic with the golfers I treat. We'll kind of start with the, the, uh, the arm and kind of work our way down to the back and, and lower legs. Uh, we see a lot of shoulder injuries. So, you know, depending on which study you look at, it's, it's probably the third or most third or fourth most common site of injury um, that we see. Um, we see injuries uh, to what we call the, the acromioclavicular joint or the AC joint, which is where your shoulder blade meets your collarbone. Um, and that can be repetitively stressed uh, when your arm is kind of reached across your body repetitively. So you can think of your, your lead arm um, kind of when you go into your backswing, um, how that would be you know, affected and can pinch there a little bit. Um, and then impingement syndrome, which kind of just means um, we, you know, our shoulders, a ball and socket joint, we have a lot of soft tissues around that joint, including muscles and tendons. Um, and sometimes, you know, with repetitive motions, those soft tissues can kind of pinch in our ball and socket joint uh, somewhat, which can cause irritation and, and tendonitis and things like that. We also see instability, which is more commonly in younger golfers. They generally have increased laxity or, or more mobility in their joints as well. So we're doing uh, training with our younger golfers for more stability training, um, getting their joints a little bit more supported and stronger. Um, and then we're also looking at what we call scapular humeral mechanics. Um, so it's just a fancy way of saying that your shoulder and your upper arm uh, and your shoulder blade are working kind of synergistically, are working well together, um, which requires a lot of coordination um, for any type of upper extremity or arm movement. We see a lot of elbow injuries as well. Uh, more um, lateral epicondylitis, which is the outside of your elbow. We actually, you know, that's commonly known as tennis elbow, but we see actually probably more of that in the clinic for golfers than, than the medial epicondylitis inside or the golfer's elbow. Um, basically, you know, either of those injuries can, uh, can be due to repetitive stress, gripping the club too, too tightly um, on the inside of the elbow. You know, sometimes we get sudden deceleration of the club head at impact if we hit the ground um, and that can kind of pull on, on our tendons that, that flex the wrist, but actually insert kind of on the inside of our elbow, which is why we feel it there. Um, and then we, we tend to see some wrist and hand injuries as well. Um, I, do, I do share uh, some patients with, with our fantastic OT team uh, here at Wentworth Douglas. They see a lot of elbow, wrist and hand injuries um, as well. So we see um, the tendonitis, the, the tendons around the, the wrists uh, can get overworked a little bit and irritated. Uh, sometimes we see a fracture in the small bones of the wrist as well if we're if we tend to hit the ground or something we're not, you know, expecting, uh, we see carpal tunnel syndrome, which is, you know, you know, more commonly known out there. Uh, you know, a lot of people doing uh, desk work, um, repetitive typing, things like that. You can get carpal tunnel syndrome, but um, with excessive gripping of the club and wrist bending, um, you can kind of compress the the tissues and the nerves uh, under the wrist, um, and which can result in that as well. 
Uh, so kind of into the meat of the presentation, you know, we see, you know, we see a lot of a low back pain in the clinic in general, but, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with our golfers as well, just because it's so prevalent. Um, it's actually 20% of all, uh, of all golf injuries um, that we see. Um, but golf may not be the, the source of the back pain, but we might have prior back pain and golf may exacerbate or worsen previous pain that we're experiencing. Um, this study for any physics nerds out there, um, this study just looked at um, just loads at um, our discs within our spine. So uh, we have spinal segments or bones uh, and uh, discs that are kind of like little jelly donuts with, within those bones, which gives our spine some support and, and flexibility. Uh, you know, you hear of uh, people uh, blowing a disc or, or injuring their disc. Um, that's kind of the, the tissue that they're talking about. Um, so this study looked at, uh, four professional golfers, their loads on their disc with their swing were only 329, uh, Newtons, uh, measurement of pressure. Uh, and then with four amateurs, the, the peak loads were at 596, which kind of shows, um, you know, amateurs likely, you know, putting a lot of, uh, pressure on those discs, uh, with their golf swings. Um, and actually the compressive load with the golf swing is about eight times the body weight and just a put that in comparison with another activity running is only about three times the body weight. Um, so in general, you're not going to swing once and, and injure a disc or, or herniate a disc from just one swing. It's more of a, it's more of a cumulative, um, injury over time, um, repetitive stress on the same tissue. And that's kind of what the cumulative load theory explains, but we see a lot of, um, you know, potential injuries to that area with what we call the X factor. So if you bring your attention to that uh, figure there, you can see that golfer at the top of his backswing. And I had mentioned earlier that when you initiate your downswing, you kind of rotate your pelvis first, you know, before you rotate the shoulders. So you can imagine you're kind of thinking about wringing out a towel with water. And then when you go to start your downswing and your hips move, you're actually your, your, your trunk stays stable, but your hips kind of ring it out a little bit more before your trunk follows. Um, so it's that rotational shear stress over time um, that can affect folks. Um, and this kind of goes in hand in hand with, with asymmetry that we see in the swing. So, you know, if you're a righty golfer, you're really, you're really only swinging righty. That's the nature of the sport. Um, so they've done studies just looking at um, you know, different areas of the back that may be affected because of that. And they're seeing that more uh, low back pain on the, on the trail side. So if you're a righty golfer, more likely to get back pain on your right side, just because of um, the repetitive stress on that side, you get some rotation and you get some side bending that can compress those structures there. Um, uh, so it's, it's a very dynamic movement, you know, especially in that point in the swing. Um, and, and you can imagine what that repetitive stress uh, can do. Um, so implications for rehab in terms of, in terms of back pain and, and something I suggest to folks, um, again, I'm not a golf professional, professional, I'm only a healthcare professional. Um, so any specifics in terms of their swing, I'm really directing them to them, um, you know, wherever their home course is. Um, but just tips that I give out to folks, just, you know, it's really important to have proper fitting clubs. So you're not bending over too much. You're not um, standing up too high and losing your posture. Um, you know, maintaining that, that proper starting posture that we discussed. Um, keeping that new, neutral uh, straight spine. Um, you know, folks can compensate in other ways by shortening the backswing or increasing their hip turn to take a little pressure off the back. Um, I always tell folks, you know, it's very important to warm up. Um, and I usually have folks, you know, swing both ways when they warm up. So they kind of maintain that symmetry. It might feel silly kind of swinging the other way, uh, but it's important and, and can prevent injury. And also just the use of like a push cart or a golf cart, you know, especially in times of injury and pain and you still want to play. Um, those are just good ways to kind of modify, modify activity. So you don't have to carry your bag. Uh, and this graphic on the bottom here is, is Bobby Jones. Um, he's kind of famous with his swing um, to kind of increase his, his backswing, potentially take a little pressure off his back and hips. He actually uh, lifts his front heel. Um, just which allows him for just a little bit more movement in that portion of the swing. Um, and another thing we look at is, is 
kind of the influence of the core muscles, kind of what are they doing timing wise? Uh, what are they doing endurance wise? Um, can they uh, maintain their strength um, and, and activation throughout the round that you're playing? Because, you know, we're out there, we're playing four or five, six hour rounds uh, potentially. Um, so this study just looked at the muscle activity of the obliques um, and the rectus abdominis, um, you know, with and, with and without low back pain, it actually didn't, um, you know, did not differ um, between the golfers there. But what they did notice was onset of the muscle activity was a little slower in golfers with pain. Um, so it's more of that motor control uh, connection when we're in pain, we have trouble um, sometimes activating those muscles that really support our spine. Um, one of those that uh, we train uh, very frequently in, in our low back patients is the transverse abdominis, uh, which, which acts kind of, you know, like a corset around our spine uh, for support. So, you know, a lot of our training, um, you know, the foundation is kind of based off of um, training that muscle. And now we'll look at uh, lower extremity injuries. So kind of going down to the hip and knee a little bit. Um, hip injuries, um, we see uh, labral tears that occur in, in younger patients, you know, 20 to 40. Um, you know, the labrum being, you know, our hip is a ball and socket joint. Um, in order to make our hip joint, the socket portion a little deeper, we have a fibrous tissue around that makes it a little, little deeper. That's called the labrum. Sometimes we can get tears in that area um, with, uh, you know, a traumatic event, repetitive overuse um, or advanced arthritis. Um, you know, symptoms of that um, can be kind of pain in, in the groin area, um, you know, with squ squatting, sitting to standing from a chair or, or getting in and out of a car. Um, are common subjective complaints um, with that area. Um, you know, the kind of the take home message in terms of hip injuries and labral tears is, you know, make sure you undergo the proper screening test for labral tears and joint impingement, uh, meaning following up with your primary care uh, orthopedist for imaging. Um, uh, imaging is kind of the gold standard for diagnosing those. Um, I'd like to talk about just the influence of hip mobility, and we'll touch on a little later kind of how all the joints in the body kind of depend on each other and, and work synergistically. Um, but it's very important to look at, um, you know, hip mobility restrictions and, and decreased range of motion um, with golfers with low back pain. Um, you know, very high prevalence of those folks um, have restricted lead, lead hip rotation um, and, and decreased low back movement or back bending there. Um, so potentially in treatment and physical therapy, sometimes we do um, hip, hip joint mobilizations to try and loosen up, loosen up the joint a little bit, increase range of motion that way with manual therapy. Um, and you can also, you know, change your swing if you'd like to. If your lead hip is stiff, you may, you know, change your foot position. Um, you know, that may decrease, uh, you know, your hip and, and low back range of motion needed uh, for that motion. Um, so I, I included this case report here because it's kind of a typical uh, rehab course that we see uh, for patients. Um, patients tend to do tend to do really well um, if they're restricted in their hip range of motion um, and get back to playing relatively quickly. But uh, in this case, it was a 42 year old male uh, with right side of uh, low back pain with, with radiation a little lower. Uh, he had pain, pain worse with golfing and days after playing. Um, on assessment, he had decreased um, lumbar range of motion um, and his uh, hip internal rotation or his hip range of motion um, was decreased. Um, there were found to be trigger points and tightness uh, in his right low back and hip muscles. Um, Portions of his, of his low back um, were hypermobile, meaning they had increased movement. Um, and notice in the upper back or the mid back, there was decreased movement. Um, so overall with this treatment, with this case study, the, the patient was seen for nine visits. There was a focus on uh, lumbar stabilization, which means core strengthening, uh, progressed from laying down um, to more functional posi positions like standing, um, and then further progressions to, to golf stance and golf specific activities. There were hip strengthening um, and manual therapy mobilizations, um, self hip range of motion stretching for a home exercise program, 
and then manual techniques um, by the, the therapist for trigger point release. And the outcome for this patient was great. They were able to golf multiple days in a row, pain-free after nine visits. Their handicap actually approved by, improved by two to three strokes. So that's good. We always want that. Um, and then mo most importantly, the follow-up at six months, those gains were maintained um, and the patient only reported uh, a 7% disability um, on their score, which is, which is low. And these are just some of the example exercises they, that they kind of had used um, in this case report uh, and some, some exercises that I use uh, frequently as well, um, trunk rotations to kind of disassociate the, the trunks and the hips and get movement there. I do a lot of work in what we call half kneeling with one knee down um, to work on lower body uh, stability and strength while, while the, the trunk and upper body is moving. And you can also progress a little bit further um, positions that, that increase the demand on balance. Um, and you can also do kind of sport specific exercises um, with the double club parallel swing um, to work on trunk rotation there. We also see knee injuries, um, not, not as common, um, but we do see them. Um, they can be caused by, you know, excessive rotation on the tibia on your femur. So your two bones that come together in your knee, um, increased movement of, the, of your lower bone kind of on the upper bone, the femur there. Um, when you do swing the, the body weight, um, you know, goes to about 75, 80% on that lead leg, um, which can add to some stress on the knee. Um, you know, we see a lot of stress on the inside of the knee, especially as we get older, we're more likely to develop, um, you know, decreased joint space in the knee uh, and arthritic changes on the inside. So we do see that. And then again, we have Tiger Woods. We see he's had every injury um, in the books, um, you know, not including knee. So what can we do in, in physical therapy to help? Um, so, you know, we do a, a full comprehensive assessment, um, you know, based on whether you want to golf or, or whatever you want to get back to. But, it, you know, in terms of golf, we look at, you know, how your joints are moving. Um, we assess, you know, how each joint, you know, how mobile is it? How stable is it? Um, where you may have impairments. Um, one of the uh, philosophies that I loosely follow from, from Gray Cook, who's a physical therapist, and Mike Boyle, who's a strength and conditioning um, guru actually locally in Massachusetts, they kind of talk about the mobility, uh, stable joint sandwich. So, you know, they think of the body as kind of chain links here. Um, each joint is kind of dependent on the joint next to it. So it's kind of alternating. Our, our neck is stable. We need our mid back to be mobile. We need our lumbar spine or our low back to be stable, our hips to be mobile, our knees to be stable and our ankles to be mobile. Um, I say kind of loosely follow because the truth is that all joints kind of have a job that they have to do. Um, and depending on which plane that you're moving in, you know, you know, some joints have more mobility or stability than others. And we also can, you know, once we decrease pain and, and get people comfortable, we can start to enhance their golf performance a little bit. So we know um, we can improve uh, stability where, where that needs to happen. Uh, you know, I tend to use more, more free weights. They can be more effective and functional than machines, you know, for club head speed and, and driving distance, um, you know, uh, with low back pain and that prevalence, um, you know, plank variations for core strengthening uh, can be a, a, important when implemented correctly. Um, we can also work on mobility with uh, daily stretching you know, of the, the muscles in the front of the hips, the hip flexors, and also work on hip rotation um, and also stretching into trunk rotation in the, in the shoulders, especially the large muscles in our back. Um, in terms of power, that's important as well. And something Rory McElroy kind of attributes to, you know, his, um, you know, increased drive distance. Um, we see him doing a lot of Olympic lifts in particular. Um, your clinic uh, that you go to for therapy may or may not have this equipment, but me personally, um, I tend to refer, um, you know, golfers uh, to our knowledgeable folks at, at the Works uh, Family Health and Fitness Center to the personal trainers over there. Um, the picture actually here is of their training academy, um, and they have state-of-the-art equipment there, um, as well as our uh, Wentworth Douglas Hospital Center for Athletes. Um, 
uh, very similarly uh, has excellent uh, folks, uh, very knowledgeable in equipment over there as well. Another thing we look at is balance, and we know balance is important um, not only for golfers but but all sports. You know, balance and athletic performance, you know, have a direct correlation. They found, and and golfers tend to actually have higher balance balance confidence. They have, um, you know, a test we do in physical therapy sometimes. It's called the functional reach, uh, where your feet are stable and you're kind of reaching forward, and um, you know, golfers are able to reach uh, more forward uh, without losing their balance. And and we know how how dynamic a movement golf, the golf swing is, um, and how much weight shifting is required as well. Um, so, so balance is very important and something we address, um, throughout treatment. Um, just to talk about the Titleist Performance Institute, uh, where I'm kind of certified, um, you know, it's developed by Greg Rose, who's a healthcare professional, actually a, a chiropractor by trade and, and Dave Phil Phillips, who's a, a swing coach, um, for many, many years uh, with professional golfers. Um, they kind of got together and created this advanced certification to work with uh, golfers uh, based on different areas of specialization. So for swing coaches, uh, medical professionals, fitness professionals, uh, coaches that work with juniors, they all kind of have their own track. Um, the, the area um, that I'm certified in uh, discuss their movement screen and, and their swing analysis as well. And you might've seen them uh, before a lot of professional golfers have at least someone who's uh, TPI certified uh, on their team and, and they've been featured on the golf channel before as well. Um, so the TPI philosophy, which I like um, because I, I kind of take a comprehensive approach to, to treating patients in physical therapy as well, where we're kind of looking at the whole person, right? And um, it's, it's not a cookie cutter um, treatment plan. It's kind of individualized uh, to everyone. And that's kind of the TPI philosophy. Uh, they believe uh, that there's no one way to swing a club, rather an infinite number of swing styles, but um, there is an efficient way for every player to swing and, and based on what, um, what the player can physically do. Um, so we can't train a lot of people to swing like Tiger Woods or Adam Scott, because their bodies, um, you know, may not be able to physically um, you know, go into those range of motions. Um, but there is a, there is an optimal way for everyone to swing based on their body type. Uh, and this is the, the movement screen, um, that I do with a lot of my patients, um, just to kind of look at, uh, you know, head to toe, uh, different body impairments that we can address, uh, throughout treatment, um, to, to improve their golf performance. So we look at strength, flexibility, balance, and coordination. Um, it's about 14 different movements that we do in the clinic. Uh, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, with some time after to kind of review with each other, kind of what we found out, um, and it's used by all providers who are TPI certified. So, you know, if you're working with, um, you know, a, a golf professional that's TPI certified and a health professional, um, you know, they can kind of speak the same language in that respect. Um, and, you know, what the most important thing is, is, you know, what does this physical screen mean in terms of golf? Um, so they, they have done studies where they found relationships between you know, how people do on the screen and different areas of the screen and, and different swing faults that they might see. So I, ideally we would have high speed cameras, right? Where we could um, see people swing faults and see how they swing, but um, that's not always the case, but we can uh, potentially predict um, what someone's uh, swing faults might look like based on the, the screen that we do. Um, and even though there's 14 kind of areas that we look at, they kind of found four really that are, that are most important and can be indicative of some swing faults um, if people have, have problems with them. And that's one of them is the, uh, the overhead deep squat, um, which is kind of looking at just squatting kind of a full, full body, um, you know, mobility assessment really. Um, and then the toe touch, which is looking at hamstring flexibility, um, single leg bridge, um, which is uh, testing, um, you know, your hip extension or your hip strength, uh, which is very important. Um, and these are some of the swing faults that we kind of see um, on the far left here. We see kind of the overhead uh, deep squat, um, what we do in that that TPI screen, um, you know, swing faults that we commonly see 
um, here is, is um, early hip extension, um, which someone, their kind of hips come forward. Um, that can be indicative of some hip weakness there that we can address. Um, this one here is kind of indicative of, of loss of posture. So someone coming through, uh, losing their posture when they swing, which can affect um, how they impact the ball. And then here on the far right, that actually a lot of golfers do, including myself, is kind of slide the hips a little bit towards the target when they swing. Um, so it's not always a bad thing to have these swing faults. Um, Jordan Spieth uh, does this in his swing. If you look on uh, from this view, his hips slide a little bit. Um, but sometimes, you know, in the amateur golfer, when we don't get that repetition, those swing faults can um, leak, uh, lead to kind of less accuracy when we're striking the ball. Um, so one thing I reinforce kind of with, uh, with all my patients or, you know, that are golfers or, or anyone that's playing a sport is to try and warm up. Uh, for at least 10 minutes prior to play or practice, um, you know, that's shown to decrease the rate of injuries. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, studies and thought out, out there about dynamic or movement-based stretching versus kind of static or holding stretching. Um, dynamic or movement-based uh, stretching activity may be recommended for, for reducing acute muscle injuries and increasing joint range of motion before you play. Um, and then this study looked at a warm up of windmills, trunk twists, static stretching, and air swings. And they actually showed that golfers who did this for seven weeks before they played um, actually increased their swing speed uh, by 24%. So that increase, uh, that, that means more distance, which is, which is what we all want, right? And just some suggestions here to reduce chance of injury. Um, again, I kind of you know, touched on, on these prior, but, you know, reinforcing using a push cart or a golf cart, if you need, um, incorporating that 10 minute, 10 minute warm up, um, in that warm up, uh, try and swing both directions to kind of get some symmetry. Um, and then within your own exercise routine that you currently do, um, or if you want to start, um, or initiate an exercise routine, um, just including, you know, hip flexibility stretches, um, you know, trunk strength and core strength and working on the timing with that, um, working on the endurance of those muscles and also, um, strengthening of, you know, the rotator cuff or shoulder muscles, um, and, and your shoulder blade muscles as well is important.